I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. How many of you are proud of your pet peeves? Now, come on now. You tell me about them all the time. How many are really proud of your pet peeves? Are you ready for one of my pet peeves? Here's one of my pet peeves. Are you ready? It's revelation, not revelations. <laughs> I even have a tie that actually says revelations on it. <clears throat> I'm going to sell it to somebody. Revelation. It's the revelation. One revelation. The revelation. Okay? Now that I've gotten that out of my system, notice revelation. Revelation chapter 3. And let's notice these first few verses together. Revelation chapter 3. Well, you almost have to, when you say revelation, you want to say it with firmness and pathos in your voice. Revelation chapter 3. And the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in wine, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, we do thank you for this morning. Again, we, we give you praise and glory just for the opportunity to, to gather together as we have sang song and, and shared our love for you in congregating together and magnifying and glorifying you, we attentively now listen carefully to what you have to say. Even as we look at that very powerful verse, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We want to have an ear this morning. And Lord, even this morning, in every single message that is ever preached, the plan of salvation can be found. Even as we ask this important question regarding the church, can a church die? My friend, can you die? Can you die and not go to heaven by not knowing Christ? If there's one here this morning who doesn't know you as their Savior, who cannot say that they know for sure that they're on their way to heaven, Lord, even now, I pray that you'd save them. I pray that even before the invitation, they would recognize their need for the Savior, recognize that they're a sinner, and ask you into their heart. And Lord, we would pray that if we have opportunity, that we'd be able to open a Bible with anyone who's not sure about their salvation. That today would be the day of salvation for them. Speak to hearts, Father, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Well, we begin a new series this morning. And uh, you can already see just by the title and uh, what I just read that we are going to be talking very, very uh, much about the church, the ministries of the church. The ministries of the church. We live in the church age. This is the age of grace. We have de-emphasized the church in the church age. What a mistake we make with all of our technology and all of our ability today to, to just plug in and listen to and hear at any time some of our favorite preachers. We have forgotten that we're supposed to, guess what? Get into the church house and hear the preaching of the word of God. Come together. Let's not forsake the assembling together of ourselves. Amen? And so my question is, how important 
or the ministries of the church to you? I think another way to ask the question would be this. Who is the church? Are you ready for some good English? We is the church. <laughs> You're the church. So this morning, let's begin by asking this important question. As you've already read uh, about one of the churches in the, in the book of Revelation, can a church die? Can a church die? Notice again, Revelation chapter 3. Let's notice that first verse one more time. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. And I'll tell you what, the Lord knows our works, doesn't he? He knows the works of the church. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. Hey, you've, there's a name, you've got a pretty good name for yourself that you're alive, but you're dead. That's what the verse says. The church is Sardis. That's what we are reading of right here. You know, I know you've heard this preacher and other preachers refer to a famous preacher from a century ago. Actually, over a century ago, because we go back to the 19th century, and we remember famous preachers like Charles Spurgeon. Anybody ever heard the name Charles Spurgeon before? Yeah. Very, very famous English preacher. Got saved at 19 years of age. Walked into a, a little backwoods church on a cold, snowy night. And there was a deacon that was preaching that morning because it was too cold for the preacher to show up and preach. <clears throat> that won't happen here. <laughs> and as the, as the deacon kind of, you know, worked his way through it, he wasn't a regular preaching kind of a deacon, but he was a deacon that was preaching. Amen? We got some around here that can do that. Amen. And that day, Charles Hadley Spurgeon asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart to be a savior. By the time he was 21 years of age, he was already passing a church of hundreds. And then, year, uh, just a few short years later, that church had had grown to literally thousands. I got to tell you something that ins inspires me. And when I read his messages and, and the depth of his messages, I think, oh my. A matter of fact, whenever I read anything that Spurgeon wrote, I got to read it three or four times. First of all, I got to get through the 18th century kind of way of speaking, <laughs> and then go deep because this man preached to a to a well taught congregation. And it was a phenomenal time. God was using this man in a marvelous way. While he was using Spurgeon on that side of the ocean, he was using D.L. Moody on this side of the ocean. This was before there was internet. This was before there was any kind of television. Any, any. This was before even there was a way to amplify one's voice. Oratory was important at that time because a man needed to be able to project his voice in such a way that people could hear it. Well, these men turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. May I tell you that today, if you were to walk into that marvelous church, the building is still there in London, you would be saddened to see that a, a, a church that at one time preached to thousands is happy that if they can gather together 100 people, uh, they're having a good day. The building is still there. It is still uh, a building that can seat thousands. It's in disrepair. It is not the building that it used to be. But that also speaks of, are you ready? The condition of Europe today. Did you know that only 2% uh, are regular church-going folks in Europe today? In England today, they are, they are basically not a Christian country anymore. The land of Spurgeon where the missionaries were sent out <laughs> has died. I would say to you that, of course, we're not all about numbers. We're about the numbers that God wants to see. And we know that God will lift up any ministry that he chooses to lift up, and if the Lord chooses to shut down a ministry, he'll shut that ministry down. How many of you would agree with that? But I'll tell you, I just believe that in some cases... 
It is not by the will of God that we have seen churches die, but by the disobedience of man. By us not recognizing and understanding that this is God's house and what we do in his house needs to be done his way. And he's the one who not only has to say, but he is preeminent and we need to be committed and dedicated to him. Amen. Can a church die? Oh, yes. You know, it's, it's tragic today that even while we still may be the most religious country in all the world and still we consider ourselves more Christian than any other country in the world. There are less people going to church today than there were just a few short years ago. Right. Oh, you will remember after 9-11, for a few months we saw a resurgence, didn't we? We saw people come back into the church. People began to say, I need to, I need to look up. I need to pray. I need to recognize there's something beyond this world. But that didn't last for very long, did it? I can tell you that today we are seeing churches make the same mistake that I think was made in some of the great churches from, from years gone by. Liberalism began to crept in, and we began to see people get away from the Word of God. We began to people, uh, see people become pragmatic in what they do. And I'll tell you, it can still happen today in good Bible-believing churches. I must tell you, I'm all about church planting. I'm thankful for church planting. You know what we mean when we say church planting, right? We're talking about someone going out and starting a church. As a matter of fact, a lot of our students at, uh, that, that go to Bible college can learn about church planting, learn how they can best equip themselves to be able to be involved in that type of ministry. But you know what else I would like to see us be much more adamant about? Would be breathing new life back into a church that is beginning to disappear. How, how sad is it when we drive by and we see a church building that used to be a church now become a, a bar or some kind of a, of a uh, you know, a trinket shop or, or a personal, uh, you know, a, a home or something like that. A place where maybe, hopefully, at one time the gospel was being preached and souls were being saved and precious families were raising their children right there in that place. It's just a hollowed out shell of a building, and the gospel is no longer being preached there. You can drive around the valley, and you can, I can point out, there's one I can look at every time I go down uh, 495 uh, in Mission. When I look to the right, I think it's over there by the, um, uh, the, the, what do you call it, what do you call that game, golf, the golf course over there. I look to the right, and I see a building. They used to be a church at one time, and it's not a church anymore. Churches are dying. Churches are dying. And I must tell you that in too many cases, in too many places, you'll walk into a church, and you won't see anybody. And, I, hey, by the way, we're thankful for our senior saints. One of the things that we are absolutely 100% adamant about around here, by the way, this really plays into uh, that very special grandparents' uh, recognition next Sunday. Amen. But we, uh, we're thankful for our senior saints. We don't kick our seniors to the curb. You know, a lot of our seniors don't feel comfortable in church in, in a lot of cases because they are told, if you can't stand up for 45 minutes waving your arms and jumping up and down, you're, you're not going to fit in around here. Well, you don't have to worry about that. We don't do that. We, we believe that, uh, uh, that, that our saints need to be recognized and honored. But the truth is, in too many cases, we can walk into some churches and there isn't anybody. Uh, there's, there's no youth ministry. There are no children running around. There are no young people. And uh, that's tragic. Some of you maybe even know of churches like that where there are a lot of, you know, good folks, older folks. But, no, but their kids are gone. Their children are gone. And there's something happening today. Can a church die? What happened to good Bible-believing churches where that began to be the case? Why do we get so excited when we see our youth leave uh, the, the children's youth ministry and move into young adulthood and continue in Christ? Why, why is that so special to us? 
because it's not happening in most places. You know, every time I look out and I see a young person who's come from a youth group and is now a young adult in Sunday school, I say, well done. The Lord has used Pastor Ashley in such a way that he has instilled in these young people the importance of continuing their Christian education and continuing to worship the Lord. Pastor Ashley, when he was at camp this year, was basically told that the group that he had was an anomaly. Did I say that right? Anomaly. It's one of those good Star Trek words that they use all the time. <laughs> In other words, they weren't used to seeing kids that enthusiastic. Uh, many that were seniors ready to get something done for Jesus, ready to move on and be used of God. They weren't used to that kind. As a matter of fact, in most cases, they're trying to figure out a way to, to tap into a few more churches that are barely hanging on with a handful of kids, maybe a two or three here or there, and trying to get something done. Have you walked around this place? Have you seen how crazy it is on a Wednesday night? It's going to get crazier in just the next couple of weeks when Awana starts back up and the youth ministry gets cranking into full gear. Can I ask you a question? Can all of that disappear? Can a church die? I say yes. If we move away from what we're doing, if we recognize that, that what we're doing is what we need to be doing, we'll be okay. But if we move away from what we're doing, we can see the blessings of God removed from this place. There's another church spoken of here in, in the book of Revelation, the church at Ephesus. The warning is that that the Holy Spirit, the candlestick, might be removed from this place. We would never want to see that take place. And so please notice with me when a church is dying. What are some of the things that happen when a church is dying? What are indications of a dying church? Hey, you want to know when it's too late to preach about a dying church? Is when you're a dying church. I am thankful for what God is doing at Maranatha Baptist Church. This is the best time, the very best time to talk about this kind of signs that point to a dying church. Are you ready? G. Campbell Morgan says that a dying church is when it's not growing in Christ likeness and souls. Have we got that? That's the next one. When it's not growing in Christ likeness and souls. I'll tell you what. If souls are not being saved, if we don't see Christ like this, we know we have a problem. Secondly, secondly we see when it, is, when it does not have the power to give birth to souls. You want to know what's really wrong with too much of the church today? The church is just shifting from place to place. Nobody ever sees anybody ever get saved. It's always somebody shifting from one place to another. The church is shifting around. The church ought to be birthing, if you will, new souls, reaching the lost for Christ. We see that a church is dying, according to G. Campbell Morgan, when it is selfish. When the springs of compassion are dried up. When love, as the fruit of the Spirit, is missing. When you do not see Spirit-filled individuals in the local church... When the, spirit, when the fruit of the Spirit is no longer there, as we read of in the church of Ephesus, you're looking at a dying church. We see that a church is dying, according to G. Campbell Morgan, when there is disunity, disintegration, and divisions in the fellowship. You know, I, I, I got to tell you, we have some folks who were saved here at Maranatha Baptist Church. All they know is Maranatha Baptist Church. But we have others in this place who could tell you they have been in situations where they have seen these kinds of things taking place in the local church. Where people are bitter, they're backbiting, there's disunity, there are divisions, there are, there's wrong spirit, and it is heartbreaking. Any of us who have ever been in a church where that has taken place, we remember our hearts being broken. And you know, there are times when people are getting ready to move and they ask me where, uh, you know, to help them to find a, a good church. And I'll do my best, but I don't know. Uh, you, can, you can look at them. <laughs> you can look
look at a website and you can read someone's statement of faith and it can look just like yours. But the Spirit of God, you can sense whether the Spirit of God is present or not when you walk into that place. And I and I must say and I and I say this and I guess I'm biased. But in a lot of cases, you're not always going to find a church like Maranatha Baptist Church. Amen. You're not. You're simply not. And I'm not saying this in a braggadocious. Well, I, I guess I'm fighting the flesh a little bit. I, there is a little bit of that. But the truth is, the truth is, I've been in ministry long enough to tell you, God is blessing in a wonderful way. That's why the Lord has laid this on my heart. Because I may, I may I just say this: when people move, when people and, and you know, jobs take us to different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, some people, I, believe it or not, some people even foolishly leave the state of Texas. Now, I don't know if that's all. Tommy, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. But some people would make that mistake. And, and I must tell you, my, my, my greatest prayer for them is to find a church with the right spirit, with the right heart, where there isn't disunity. They, oh, they might be smiling on the outside, but there's... There's hostility on the inside. We see that a church is dying. Are you ready for this? When its emotions are cold, when it loses the capacity to become excited about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change lives. May I tell you something? When we stop getting excited about souls being saved, about God doing big things, we are in big trouble. There are churches you can walk in today and you can say, hey, I just had the privilege and I give God all the glory of having the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and they trusted Jesus as Savior. And the response will be, oh, really? Yeah, that's good. What's your dinner? <laughs> right. yep. May I ask you a question? Do you think God is happy when souls are being saved? Do you think that the angels, you don't have to think it because the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents. Amen. And that's good enough for me. And if and if heaven's all excited, I think we ought to be. Amen. I've had people in the past say, you know, you guys get a little too over to the top about, you know, souls being saved. You get too excited even about people getting baptized. I'm telling you what, we're going to get excited about those kinds of things. Amen. When we stop being excited, that's when I'm going to be very concerned. Because, my friends, death is on its way when these factors are at work. Why do we preach on this today? Because if there's even just a small glimpse into the possibility that our spirit might head in that direction, we want to challenge ourselves to see it early and tamp it down quickly. Not only have I read what G. Campbell Morgan has to say, but... William Barclay says that a church is dying, notice, when its members have interest without commitment. Amen. I mean, I want you to think about that. Interest without commitment. The new way of doing church today is to say, we're going to serve it up your way. We're going to make it more convenient for you. Amen. Matter of fact, I saw somebody take this a little bit further. It was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but they said, hey, listen, we're going to make sure that we just cater to your every need. Mm. You don't want to get dressed up? Hey, look, wear your worn-out shorts and your tore-up t-shirt, whatever you want, just, you know, no big deal. And you know what? If you want to come in 10 or 15 minutes later, we'll restart the message for you because we know that it wouldn't be fair for you not to have received the whole message, so we'll start all over again. Hey, look, if you... Uh, you know, want to get up and jump up and down and, and uh, you know, do whatever, we'll, we'll accommodate you. Now, of course, I'm a little over the top with that, but the truth is, we talk more about what the church can do for you than what you can do for the Lord. Amen. We spend more time talking about how it's about you and how you're entitled to have this and that I'm entitled to have the very best music. I'm entitled to hear the very best preaching. I'm entitled to enjoy the very most comfortable setting. I'm entitled to have all of these things. But I'm not committed to anything. Yep, that's it. I'm not going to commit to Sunday school. I'm not going to commit to ministry in the church. I come in expecting yep. something. You know, we tried something 100, 
about 200 years ago, really, that was a tragic mistake. We took American Indians and we put them on reservations and we told them that they don't need to do anything. We'll pro provide everything for them. And I can speak with authority because I spent time on the mission field as a missionary to the Option Indian. And I saw what this entitlement mentality produced. Hmm. Here's a free education. Here is free health care. Here is free this and free that. You don't do anything. We don't expect anything from you. You don't have to do any work. You don't have to do anything. And you can drive through reservations where brand new F-150 pickups are jacked up on their blocks and the wheels are sold because somebody wanted to buy drugs with, those, with that vehicle. And there's this entitlement mentality. The church has an entitlement mentality today. Mm -hmm. If they don't do this, I'm not going to be happy about that. And I can always just go down the road. I can, I can find somebody who will, who will believe what I want them to believe, who won't tell me anything that I don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's where I'll go. I can go. I can go where nobody will know my name. Mm -hmm. I can go where nobody will even know that I came. Yeah, we're interested, but we're not committed. I think Barclay has something there. Barclay also says that a church is dying when it's substituting good things for truly central things in the faith. I have another way of putting that. That's called keeping the main thing the main thing. I remember watching a video. By the way, if you're looking for a good Christian video, go by and see the Ashley's. They don't keep good uh, books, so you can keep that video for as long as you want. But it's so quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got a few videos. I'm going to get them back to you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in one of the videos, there was, uh, this was the one where the movie was about somebody who was transformed from the, from the 19th century to the 21st century uh, by a time machine. And he said that if people will just be moral, they'll be okay. And morality without God is not okay. Right. And that was a very good message. And uh, when he was trans, when he was, when he was, when he was transported into the 21st century, he showed up at church, and church was about, hey, we got a great softball team over here. Hey, we're able to do this, and we're able to do that, and we're hip and cool and trendy. Uh, but faith was nowhere to be found. And the main things were not the main thing. Nobody was telling anybody about Jesus. That was something that was supposed to be done, you know, by the pastor. Uh, and it wasn't really a salvation decision. It was just an assent that, hey, yeah, this sounds like a neat place to raise my family. And, and, and he was shocked. And he realized that his, his position paper that stated that morality will change the world was wrong. Only faith in Jesus Christ will. And so moral churches don't change our lives. Right. We know that a church is dying when it's lost its missionary dynamic. You hear us talk about how we're a missions-minded church. We don't just say that we mean it. We cannot be a missions-minded church if we're not interested in souls. If we're not interested in seeing the good news of Jesus Christ go across the, across the street, across the river, across the ocean, across the world, that's what missions is all about. But we also believe that we're all missionaries. You and I. There are only two kinds of people in this world, and I really do mean this. I used to say saved and unsaved. That's not the case. I believe it's missionaries. You're either a missionary or you're the mission field, my friend. Once you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know, mm -hmm. you need to go. Amen. You need to have a burden for souls. Yes. When we lose our missionary dynamic, that's, that's an indication. That's a real indication. I will tell you in real life truth that I have watched that take place. I have watched our, we have um, a missionary in Australia right now. Anybody know his name? Buddy Smith. I know that Sister Monty would know because she handles the books 
for Buddy Smith, and we are his sending church. I'm actually his pastor, and, and this is his sending church, and we also receive all of his checks from the churches uh, that are supporting him. And he has, over the last 30 years, watched churches implode from within. And where does it begin? It begins with missions. They start cutting back on missions. They start cutting away uh, th that important uh, focus on reaching the world. And before you know it, they no longer exist. We see, in addition to these descriptions, it may be suggested that the church is also dying for these reasons. Are you ready? When it forgets its unique nature. The church is the body of Jesus Christ himself. The local church is a manifestation of that body. Did you know that the, the word body, to have a body of believers is biblical and that we are members? When we talk about membership, that's a very biblical word. Because we are members of the body of Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. When we forget that Jesus Christ himself is the church, we're headed in the wrong direction. Amen. I would suggest that a church is dying when its unique mission goes unfulfilled. The church is the only body in the world that has the unique task of proclaiming God's love and forgiveness. It's more important to belong to a local Bible believing church than to be a member of Congress. Amen. It's more important, and by the way, I, I'm thankful for Christians in Congress. But I'm more thankful for Christians right here where I'm at, serving Jesus Christ, recognizing the importance of ministry in the local church. Can I tell you, what a great privilege, what an honor it is to, to, to come together as a local body of believers and be used of God in this way. Amen. I still can't get over what a, what a high calling that is, what a great privilege it is. I'm not sure how we don't see that sometimes. How it's easy for us just to kind of put our, our identity with our local church kind of on the outside, looking in. Oh, we, oh, yeah, we think about church every once in a while. Maybe every once in a while when we show up on a Sunday morning. Mm. Can I tell you something? We are so privileged, and it is so exciting that we can have an impact, that we can make a difference in lives. And the most important difference that will ever take place is when somebody comes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But we don't finish with that. That's only by the beginning. We have the privilege and the, and, and, and the honor of having the most important role that a person can have in another person's life that can uniquely change their life. It's not going to be, it's not going to be programs, it's not going to be the world that changes someone from within. It's going to be the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And it's going to be you having the privilege of being part of that. We see that it's it's clearly an indication that a church is dying when its unique mission goes unfulfilled. And I gotta tell you something. We are here for a reason. We are the most significant entity as far as God is concerned in doing big things right here where we're at. We see that a church is dying when it, are you ready for this one? And I, I gotta tell you something. This is a real problem today. A church is dying when it's no longer uniquely Christian. When that's not the highest priority. We see that. Jesus suggests this in Revelation chapter 3. Notice verse 4 again. Notice, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which are not defiled, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white. For they are worthy. We have a lot of churches that have defiled their garments. The church there was conforming to contemporary life rather than changing it. Amen. When the church looks out at the world and says, be more like the world, look more like the world, talk more like the world, walk more like the world, sound more like the world, smell more like the 
world, then the world will come running to you. That's not church anymore. Amen. And that's the church at Sardis. Mm -hmm. They became more like the world rather than transforming the world. A church is dying when it substitutes form for force. <clears throat> Notice what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. I mean, I, that gives me chills. <laughs> I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Oh, you've got a name. And people even think you're alive, but you're dead. That's the church of service. You see, the, the dying church in many ways, as far as the world is concerned, is the church that everybody's looking to, that sees as the new standard. As a matter of fact, some refer to, the, the, in many cases today, the emerging church is the church that, every, that appeals to everybody, that everybody's happy about, that everybody is drawn to, that is drawing away from the Lord. We read in John chapter 15 what needs to be the priority. John chapter 15 says, I am the vine, 15, 5 says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, ye can do nothing. A real abiding church is a church that's focused on him. So, how does the church die? Simply expressed, the church dies in the hearts of its members. That's how churches die. We're the church. And whenever death comes, it always comes to us as individuals. You know, I don't mean that it's death to a program or death to a personal relationship or, or, or death to... You know, something that you're doing. I, I can tell you, the Lord will even raise up uh, ministries of the church and he'll change ministries and go different directions. I'm talking about the heart of people. I'm talking about the direction that individuals are headed. When I see people at one time excited about the things of God and growing in their walk and relationship with the Lord, and then suddenly they become less interested, it's not suddenly really, it never is. We see this way before they think we see this. Can I tell you that this doesn't happen to just adults? <clears throat> Youth ministry sees young people who get saved. They begin to move ahead for Christ. They get to see God do big things in their life. And before you know it, maybe something like a job or, or a girlfriend comes along and all of a sudden, church isn't the same priority that it used to be. Hey, look, I don't have a problem with, with employment. I don't have a problem with the fact that, that uh, you know, you make the decision in your local family about how interrelationships are supposed to be. But I will tell you this. It can happen early. Yeah. But you say, well, that's youth ministry. What about the church? Mm. What about the ministry in the local church? When I see someone who at one time demonstrated just a uh, let's go out and get it done kind of attitude, I'm ready, sign me up, let's go, let's do it. Before you know it, it seems like there's always some major catastrophe going on, some distraction, something pulling them away, some emotional roller coaster that begins to happen again and again and again. And they, they say they want to be used and they can't be used because they got to go do this and they got to go do that. They gotta fix this, and they gotta make that right, and they gotta get some rest, and they gotta get there, and they gotta do. But you know what? The truth is, it's a spiritual concern. Mm -hmm. It really is. I'll tell you what, I've been around people who who are a lot <coughs> less able as far as their human abilities are concerned than many of us who do a whole lot more for the Lord. Amen. I mean, I can't I can't put it any other way than that. 
I was thinking yesterday, we have, uh, even as we were out knocking on doors yesterday, uh, we have had the privilege over the years of seeing, well, I remember when Junior was, I think, 11 years old, he got saved and on a Friday, and on Saturday, he was out knocking on doors, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with his crazy maniac uh, family. <laughs> And his cousin. I'll uh, leave the rest of it for you. And I can remember seeing TJ walking alongside with Brother Russell Mapes. Mm -hmm. Russell Mapes, 87 years old. TJ, 13 years of age, out sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? That makes a difference, doesn't it? Amen. May, I, may I just say this? Churches die when we begin to see us being less excited about things like this, us less involved in being involved in things like this, right. and recognizing that there was a time when these things used to matter to us much more. And so let me, let me finish with this. I'm going to simply ask this question. And you know, this happens every generation. If this message was preached in the 60s, it would be the same question. The 70s, the 80s. Man, I've been around for all those. <laughs> 90s. <laughs> Can't believe it. You realize that the 21st century is, is, has become a teenager? 13? How about that? Can the church live in an age like ours? Well, should we just throw up our heads and say, it's too tough. It's too hard. There's too much coming against us. Well, first of all, we don't know our Bible if we ask that question because all we need to do is take ourselves back to Bible times, take ourselves back to the church uh, and how it existed in Asia Minor, go back to uh, Corinth, go back to some of these places where Prostitution was a known religion. And, well, that sounds a whole lot like America today, doesn't it? Yeah. And we'll see that the church has always been challenged. Has always been challenged. I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ, in speaking to Sardis, confidently states that a church can live. In fact, it will not die when it truly, when it truly is related to Jesus Christ. Three observations quickly, and we'll finish with this. First, a church can live if it responds to Christ properly. He uses three imperatives in verse 2. Notice what he says. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. That's what the scripture says. Be watchful. That's why we preach this message today. Amen. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So the warning is to us now, be watchful, be ready to strengthen those things. We Christians are always <laughs> to be living in an atmosphere of Christ's mighty effect on our lives. I'll tell you what, if you're, if you're not moved about what God can do in your life, if he's not affecting your life, you're not affecting anyone else's life. Yeah. Mm. In verse 3, Jesus calls for repentance in the life of the Sardis church. We must constantly deal with the sins of our lives. We, we recognize that, a, that it is sinful for a church to be spiritually lifeless when Christ will give it spiritual power. You see, walking in the spirit and not in the flesh is not personal. It's what we're supposed to do as a church. And when you choose not to, when I choose not to, we harm the work of the church. Amen. When we choose not to be here when the doors are open, we're the ones that are harming the work of the church. Amen. It's not about me. It's not about you. Amen. It's about the church that the Lord has chosen to use in this Jerusalem. May I ask you a question? Are we helping or hindering the work of the local church? Are we on top? Are we part of the problem? Or are we part of the solution? Are we the ones that are ready to say, here I am, Lord, use me? 
Or are we part of that, I don't think I can be a part of that crowd? You see, a second observation is that the church can live even if only a few are concerned. I'll tell you, this is something, isn't it? And I have seen this happen over the years. I have seen where God worked in a mighty way in local churches. And the church began to head in the wrong direction. But there were a few crazy knuckleheads. That's good Greek that I learned from Pastor Ashley. <laughs> they would not give up. They would not let go. They would not say, we're done. We're through. And they kept on working. They kept on serving. And they kept on praying. And they kept on asking. And they kept on looking to the Lord, and they kept on trusting Him, and God blessed, and He turned things around, and God blessed, and He continued to turn things around, and before you know it, those few became those many who God used in a mighty way, and I'm here to say, a church is never dead until the last one who cares walks out. Mm -hmm. A church is never through until the church is through with you. Amen. May I ask you a question? What are you going to do to make sure that your church continues to be and strives to be in a much more important and impactful way the church that God wants Maranatha Baptist Church to be. We don't want to, we don't want to ever be a church like Sardis who's, who people say, oh yeah, we hear good things about that church. But on the outside we may look good, but on the inside we've begun to allow for some of this to take place. The question was asked, and I believe the Bible clearly answered it for us this morning. Can a church die? Yes, it can. Can a church like that great, powerful church in England that Spurgeon preached at for several years go from thousands down to dwindling numbers of just a few? Yes. Are there solid Fundamental independent Baptist churches that used to be getting something done for the Lord today that aren't doing much anymore? Yes. Are there, are there good, solid, Bible-believing Christians who have lost their way? I say yes. Recognize how God wants to use you to be a very central and integral part of the local ministry in the local church. And as we've been talking about on Sunday night, it all goes back to this. Church is about people. Ministry is about people. Looking for new ways and new opportunities to impact more in, in a greater way. My vision today is let us take the wonderful momentum that we have and now move to that next level where discipleship becomes the calling of, those, of this local church, where we not only see souls saved, but we look for greater opportunities Amen. to impact their lives. As we go out and knock on doors, as we just think of our own friends and family, how many of us in this room would say that we know of someone who's suffering with some type of an addiction? <laughs> well, whenever, let me do, let's, let's do, let's ask, how many know of someone who's suffering who, who you think of, who you love, you're praying for, who you know, maybe you're even mad at, that's suffering with some type of an addiction. I'm, I'm looking at least 50% of your hands, but more than that, more than that. Because I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol, am I? Nope. We could be talking about pornography. We could be talking about health issues. And you say, well, what are we talking about health issues? You know that we can be doing unhealthy things that hurt us, and that can be an addiction. Amen? Amen. Oh, my. <laughs> That just means all of our hands need to go up, right? Hey, I, I remember hearing about a young lady who trusted Christ as Savior, and her struggle was that she was bulimic. And she hated it, and she could not stand. She was one of those that would eat and purge. And, and basically, you go and eat, and you go, and you, you throw it all up. Not only will that tear up your esophagus and, and send you to an early grave, but the, you know, the fact that you're starving yourself to death will kill you also. And her addiction was her self-image. May I tell you something? We want to look for greater opportunities 
to be used by God in a greater way to minister to the whole family. And always remember this as a high priority. Recognize that people need Jesus. People need the Lord. The first most important work that can ever be done in anyone's life is that they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The real problem with too many churches today who decide, well, we want to be able to minister to church, to, to, to people in a greater way, the first thing they do is they kick to the curb salvation. They want to start treating, it's like, it's like trying to treat the disease without recognizing what the real uh, reason for the cause of the disease is. And the cause of the disease is sin. And so we'll continue to do what we do, but we'll look for greater ways of the Lord to continue to minister to people. May I ask you a question? Can a church die? Yeah. The answer is yes. And let's listen. Oh, but that would it, it would have been Sardis that listened to Jesus when he asked them to listen. Let's all stand.